On this episode of Josh's Car Corner, I'm going to take it back to basics by showing you how to do a proper oil change. And as an added bonus, I'm going to show you some hidden instruments that you've probably never seen before on the Pontiac GTO. So the car we're going to be working on in this show is in fact not my GTO, this is my friend Nick's GTO who lives down here in Arizona. This thing's pretty wicked, he's got a truck LS block built up in this thing with a supercharger on top of it and it's all done up, it runs on E85, it's got a methanol system, it's got a water to water in cooler. It's good for about 700 wheel horsepower, you know, in case you need to get up a steep hill or something. And if you want to see a full feature on this car, let me know in the comment section. Maybe we can do that someday. But for today, we're just going to use it for our candidate to do an oil change. See, the reason I decided to do this episode is somebody recently uh, got me on a Facebook group called YouTube Auto Vlogs. Basically just a Facebook page for people who do car shows like I do to get together and show off the different shows they're doing and show what they're doing in the car community and just a place for people to exchange ideas and whatnot. And a guy put a video on there talking about how he went to one of those oil change places and they really did a bad job. They screwed up his car, uh, did some damage to it, and it brought up two questions to my mind. And the first question was, why would you ever think that a guy who sees dozens of cars every day would pay any kind of respect or attention to detail to your car. And secondly, if you're interested in cars, why aren't you changing your own oil? So I thought to myself, well, maybe it's just because people are afraid to do it because they've never done it before. They've never seen it done. They think it's going to be complicated. They don't want to screw their car up. So why not do an episode on how to change oil? So that's what we're going to do. So this is the uh, patient for today. We've already got it up in the air, it's cooled off, and we're going to start in the front and just start the whole process and I'll show you everything that goes into changing the oil on your car. Okay, so the first thing we have to do on the GTO is take out the skid plate. If your car doesn't have one of these, some previous owner neglected to put it back in or thought it wasn't necessary, it's necessary. The last thing you would want is something to come up and hit your aluminum oil pan or your filter and all of a sudden you have no oil in your engine. So if this isn't here, get one. BMR suspension may still sell them, or you can find them off of wrecked cars and yards. Okay, so on the GTO and most modern GM cars, your drain plug is 13 millimeter. Now, here's the thing that's important to know. On a rear wheel drive car, the engine and everything is laid out forward to back. So your oil pan is always going to be the frontmost pan you see under the car. If you have an automatic transmission in your car, you'll have another pan back here and it might have a drain plug on it, but the oil pan is always going to be directly under the motor. So if you have a front wheel drive car, the way to know which pan is the oil pan and which pan is the transmission pan is to look at where the belts are on the engine. The belts on a most front wheel drive cars are always going to be on the passenger side. So therefore the transmission is always going to be behind the engine, so your transmission would be right here. So your drain plane plug should be over on this side. Some Japanese cars, that's reversed, and the transmission's on this side, and the belts are over here. So then you got to be looking for your drain pan and your plug on this side. But for most American stuff, it's going to be over here. So here it is on our GTO. All you got to do is start backing it out. There's no special washer thread on it. The only thing you got to be careful of is once this comes out, it's going to gush. So you might want to, at first, unless you've got a really big opening on your pan, hold your pan up like this. And then as the oil starts to flow out of the engine, this gusher is going to start to slowly taper off. And it'll actually go back behind the drain hole a little bit before it gets to almost no oil and starts dripping. And then it'll drip straight down. You don't want to drain your oil when it's ice cold because it'll be thicker. You want your oil to be thin so you can get more of it out of the engine. You're changing the engine oil, you want to get as much of it as you can. Just make sure when you pull this out, you pull back quick. And I'm just going to hold it at first. Because if you can see here, I don't know if you can see on the camera, but we've got the big gusher right here and then we've got a little drip back here. 
So if I held it down, there's no way I could catch a bolt with this pan right now. So we're just gonna let this get down to the point where I can set it down and then I'll let gravity and the ground do its thing. Whew, that's hot. Oh Christ. There we go. Whew. While this is draining, one other thing I'm gonna point out, especially if you've built your motor and it's got a lot of performance parts in it, Factory drain plugs don't have this, but you might want to consider getting one. Get a drain plug with a magnet in it. If you've got a performance engine and you, something starts going wrong in it and it starts carving up metal like on bearings or on camshafts or cranks or journals or something, those pieces will get picked up on the drain plug. So the next time you go to change your oil, if you've got metal built up on it, you'll know something's going on in the engine and you could potentially save it before something catastrophic happens. So if you don't have a magnetic drain plug, I would recommend that you get one. Okay, now we're to the point where we can take the oil filter off. But the first thing you want to do, just so you don't have two oil leaks going on at once, is to put the drain plug back in. Now, it's always a good idea just to make sure the threads are really clean on this before you just slap it back in there. So, just a little bit of brake cleaner. Then just take a good shop towel or paper towel or whatever and just work it back off the threads. Like you're taking it out of something, just counterclockwise. You know, grab everything out of the threads and... Make sure the magnetic part's all clean if you have it, and just put her back in. Now when you put these in, keep in mind, oil pans are not thick things. There's only about two threads on this oil pan, three max, so this thing does not have to be reamed on there like your Valvoline place will do. It really just needs to be snug, and that's about it. I mean. If you wanted a, a foot-pound rating for it, I'd say no more than 30 foot-pounds. It really just needs to be snug. It's not going to back off. It's metal on metal. It's going to stay in there good. So now the next thing is going to be to get this filter off. We just want to reposition our drain pan. Now when you start to turn this thing, first thing that's going to happen is the oil is going to start to run down the sides of it. That's to be expected. But let that happen first. Because that'll give you a good idea where to set your pan so you don't drip oil everywhere. And it's going to run down for a little bit here, and I'm just going to put my hand here just to make sure it doesn't splatter all over the ground. But eventually this running will stop, and once it's got to the point where it's just kind of dripping, then you can take your filter off. Okay, now one thing I'll point out is on this car, fortunately, the oil filter is vertical. That's not always going to be the case. Sometimes they're mounted horizontally on the engine. Sometimes they're up underneath the subframe or the suspension mounted in a goofy way, and then oil is going to run all over the place. You can't avoid that. But the principle is the same. You just back it off until it's done with this big running, and then you can just slowly take it off and this can get kind of messy if you're wearing nylon gloves because it's going to slip in your hand, but just take your time. Um, it's got to go a good amount of turns. And just like that. And then just turn it over, let it drain because it's still got a lot of oil in it. And then let it all drain out of the uh, oil filter assembly right there before you put a new one on. One thing I like to do while I'm in here is just also clean off the oil pan really good, get all the oil residue off it because if you have a leak, the next time you go to change your oil, if oil is built up in here a bunch again, you'll know it. And then you'll know you've got something else you want to trace down. Not a bad idea, just take the, wipe the excess oil off the mating surface here. Make sure that's nice and clean. Now, one other thing I want to point out before we put a new oil filter on here. Now if you go to your local parts store and get your oil filter and all your oil and such there and you get the AC Delco, it's going to recommend that you get the PF46 filter. This is what's supposed to go on the GTO. However, I discovered a few years ago that the truck LS motors, the 4H, the 5.3s, the 6.0s, whatnot, they use the PF61 oil filter. Now the difference here and the reason I like them is the size. If you look, the PF61 is considerably bigger. In fact, what I have discovered is that you can have an extra quarter quart of oil in the engine. So if you use this filter, you can get about five and three quarter quarts in there if you just got an NA motor, but this, you can get a full six quarts in there and it's usually perfect on the dipstick when you're done. However, this is something else to consider because Nick just pointed this out to me. The PF46 has an anti-drain back valve built into it. The PF61 does not. Now. 
it's your choice whether the how important that is to you. If you really feel you need an anti-drain back valve in the oil filter, obviously GM doesn't think it's necessary for the trucks or this would have one. So I don't think it's that big a deal, but for that little extra capacity and that little extra filtration material, I like the 61 over the 46. And you don't necessarily have to use the Delco. You can get the equivalent of the PF61 if you want something that's a little bit bigger. It clears the oil pan. It doesn't hang down lower than it, so it's in no danger of getting damaged or ripped off. So that's just what I prefer. So here's the other thing that's important before you put the oil filter on. Two things. One, never put these things on with a dry seal because these need to slip to get enough tension on them so when they make contact with the oil pan, they slip enough to get them tight. Otherwise, this rubber seal will catch and it might actually twist and it could get damaged trying to put it on. So take your brand new oil, just get a little bit on your finger, and just go around that seal and get it nice and wet. Important thing number two, pre-fill your new filter with oil. What's the reason for this? It's because when the oil pump grabs oil out of the pan and starts to pump it through the engine, the first place it goes is the filter. So if you put a brand new oil filter on the engine and it has no oil in it, then the first thing the pump has to do is fill this up with oil before it can get any oil to the engine. So that means you're going to have a few seconds there while this is getting filled up where you're starving the engine and there's no oil pressure. Now that might not be a big deal in the grand scheme of things, but your bottom end never likes having no pounds of oil pressure on its bearings and its crank journals and all that stuff. So it's always a good idea before you put your new oil filter on, fill it up. And you got to do this a couple times because you'll fill it, oil will soak into the filter material and it will go down and then you want to fill it up again. Now obviously if your filter mounts horizontally or at a goofy angle you can't get it completely full because it's going to spill out when you try to put it on. But having something in there is better than having nothing in there when you go to put it on the engine. Okay, so we're at the point now where we're putting it on. Now the thing is, you don't have to jam this on here as tight as you can. And the reason is, once this rubber seal heats up, it's going to swell. And it's going to make this thing way tighter than when you put it on. So this is the same deal as your oil drain plug. It just has to be kind of snug. That right there is about enough. And then again, I wish I could give you a foot pound running on it. You just kind of got to feel it with your hand. If it's to the point where you just can't ease it back off, you're probably tight enough. And a little bit of force, it starts to spin, you're probably right where you want to be. That's really all the tighter it needs to be, I promise you. When you go to take it off next time, you're going to have to put a lot more force on it than you had did do when you put it on. Okay, so we have got six quarts in the engine, but we're not going to fire this thing up yet. We're going to cap it off, I'm going to clean the dipstick off, and then I'm going to show you some really cool readouts on the factory gauge cluster that you probably never knew about, but are really handy if you're ever trying to troubleshoot or see what's going on with your car. Okay, so you may not have known when you got your car, but there's actually a bunch of extra gauges you can get access to in the center cluster here when you go into what's called diagnostic mode. Now there's a little trick to getting into it. First thing you have to do is before you even turn the key on, you have to hold down mode and set. Then all you do is you turn the key to on, and when you turn the key to on, it'll say version and serial number to let you know you did it right, and then once it comes up, you'll be able to access a bunch of other gauges that you didn't know you had before. So all you got to do is hit mode to go through them. So there's your GM part number for your computer. There's your voltage at your uh, switch right now. Here's your battery voltage, 11.9 volts. Brake voltage, if I were to press the brake pedal, you would see voltage. Fuel calibration part number, I'm not sure what that is, but it gives you that. Petrol sender valve, that is a reading of how much fuel is in the tank out of 255. So there's 224 parts out of 255 in the fuel tank. Remaining fuel, 17 gallons. Instantaneous fuel economy, zero gallons per hour. If that were running, it would be just like this reading up here in the upper right that you normally get under the fuel gauge. Here's a, a really important one for some people, coolant temp. So you can actually see, instead of the dummy gauge, which basically says the same thing between 190 and 230 degrees and doesn't move, now you can get an actual numerical readout of your coolant temp. Speed is also in there. Tachometer, if you want an accurate to the tenth or zero RPM reading. Parking lamps on or off, it'll tell you. Daytime running lamps on or off, it'll tell you. If there's trouble codes and you understand binary, you can read the trouble codes in here. And then you can go to this mode, which just makes it all freak out. But then push 
mode again and you're back to the beginning and cycling again. And if you want to get out of it, just hit the set button and you're back to normal. So if you ever want to get extra gauges out of your uh, dashboard, they are in there. There's just a secret to getting into them and now you know that secret. Okay, so we got the engine full of oil and everything is buttoned up. So what Nick's gonna do now is back the car off the ramps and we're gonna get it on the level surface and then that'll give it enough time to run and get the oil cycled and then we can get an accurate reading on the dipstick of how much oil we've got in the engine. Okay, we're now on a flat level surface and we're just gonna take a check of the dipstick. Now, when you pull it out, it's gonna be covered in oil that's been splattering all over the engine. So you have to clean it off, get it nice and clean. Put her back in. Now you can get your reading. Hold it vertically, you'll always be able to see where the oil stopped going up the stick. And we are right at the top. So that is perfect. That's actually where you want it after it's been running. Because if it's uh, running and it's lower than that, you could actually add a little more. It can, after it's been sitting for a few hours, it can get over full. But as soon as you start it up again and oil starts cycling through the system, it'll get where it wants to be. So hopefully, after seeing this, you now have the confidence to change the oil in your own car. And I encourage you to do it because not only will you save yourself a ton of money doing it yourself, you can use better grade oils and filters than any lube shop will use. And you know it's being done right because you're the one who's doing it. So once again, Thanks for watching Josh's Car Corner, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey, thanks for watching the show. If you like the show, let me know by clicking that subscribe button, and you can always follow what's going on with the show on Instagram at Josh's Car Corner. And also, on top of things, this is why you always check to make sure the vehicle is clear and there's nothing behind you. As you can see, my gym bag with my work clothes, saline solution for my contacts, Rockstar, protein bars, all soaked, all wrecked, needs to be rewashed before I go to work in the morning, but it didn't break my phone charger. So we call that a win. Still a win. Still a win. <laughs>